All right. So um, the last <coughs> few weeks leading up uh, to our Christmas party, we, we started a venture where it's my heart that we as a body um, would reintroduce uh, to the body, to ourselves, the, the purpose of discipleship, going back to the basics, if you would. Um, and I mean, I have months and months and months and months and months of material that we can work through. And, and I'm, I'm going to methodically go through what I believe to be of the most importance for today, because I believe that we should return to a root of discipleship. Uh, the purpose of discipleship is to not just go over the mundane stuff that we've turned it into, but the purpose of discipleship is to present the Word of God in, in, from the perspective of, of it really truly being alive. These are the words of Christ. He, he was the Word. Can I get an amen? And, and it's His words that do so much for us. And so uh, I, I have a few things that I want to say, and we're going to do a little bit of a recap because... We started two weeks ago looking at a list that I have found in the Word of God um, of things that we were delivered from. We went from being this to being this. And it's not just one or two items. There's, there's actually a whole, a whole list of things that, that the gospel has taken us from, out of, away from, into another area. And so I, I want to be redundant in that area. I want to be thorough in that area so that we fully understand that our Christian walk isn't just going to a church. It's not finding the right group of people. It's not just being obedient. There's so much more at work than just a God that wants us to obey him. He's in the middle of everything. And this isn't just church to me. This is exciting to me. This is life. I the reason I'm, I'm ready to get out of the celebration of Christmas and get back into a norm is because I still believe there's so much revelation that's going to come through this church in the year 2024. And I'm ready to get to it. Amen. Amen. I, I, I'm still excited when I open the Word and I tackle what the Holy Spirit is taking us into. Uh, even if some of it is just kind of a refresher course, uh, it excites me to, to connect to the Word of God because the Word of God is alive it's powerful, and it's changing lives. Can I get an amen? amen. And so the, the purpose of rediscovering the, the, what discipleship is, is we, we talk about the gospel a lot in this, is we, we, there's no commandment in there that says we have to change for the gospel. But the gospel is what changes us. Can I get an amen? Yes. The gospel is what changes us. Um deliverance is when you and I are taken out of Egypt. Discipleship is when Egypt is taken out of us. And there's a process in there. And God wants both to happen. He wants to deliver us out of whatever Egypt was for you and I. But just because He delivers us out of Egypt doesn't mean the work is complete. Now he wants to go to work on the inside and remove whatever Egypt was in us. And that only comes through a process. Deliverance can happen instantly. Discipleship is going to take time. Amen. And, that, and that's, where we, that's where we dropped the ball in the body of Christ in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, in the 2000s. We dropped the ball on discipleship. We, we were bringing people in like crazy. We were seeing the gifts of the Spirit at work. We just didn't disciple the way we needed to. And now what we need to do is go back and disciple everybody who will open their hearts, their ears, and their minds to his word so that we don't get goofed up in our doctrine. Can I get an amen? Yes. Now, can somebody help me read tonight? Um, there's, there's a few things. We started a list three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and we just got two or three items on that list. And we're going to pick up. I'm going to recap those, and we're going to pick those up and keep walking through that list of what the gospel has taken us from and what it's taken us into. But there's a few things that I want to communicate to you to help emphasize the importance of discipleship. Um, but who, who can help me read tonight? Brother Roy, will you please go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now let's just read together the first eight verses. Oh, we can write songs about this and poems and books. and This is... This is fun to quote at funerals and, and, and I mean, just whatever we want, weddings, and, you know, 
Because there's, there's an axiomatic truth in this. I, and I, I want to emphasize a specific point. Uh, so if you will, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. See, I, I don't know if I've read through the entire every word of the Bible or not, but I learned something new. Ecclesiastes means the preacher. It means the what? The preacher. The preacher. Now, I, I didn't know that. I, I never, what it says on the top. We learned something in church tonight. Amen. Let's just call amen and go home. <laughs> no, this is, this is a book that tends to get overlooked a lot of times because it, it's, it's, it's used in gap field more than it is doctrinally speaking. And I say we need to do it justice and look at it doctrinally. And I want to look at the first eight verses and go through this list of the first eight verses and not look at it as a song we're writing or a poem we're reading or a book that's being written. I want to look at it as in perhaps maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something when we apply it to the gospel. All right, if you would. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get or seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. A couple weeks ago, I, I was headed to the church on, on a Wednesday uh, about 11 o'clock. And I needed to stop and fuel up and get some mints and drink and whatever. And so I pulled up, and as I, I got out to start pumping my my, my fuel, I, if you guys don't know about me, I'm I, I'm always trying to look at everybody that's around me because I think we live in a day and an age where we don't need to have our faces buried in our phone. We need to look at what's going on around us, and so it's kind of habit for me. And so naturally, as I got the thing pumping, I'm I'm kind of marking. Who I'm around? Who's around me? And the right, the, the same pump I'm at on the other side, it, it, it caught my attention because there was a, a young lady probably in her maybe early 30s. She, she, you could tell that she, she didn't have, she wasn't coming from necessarily a rough life, but she was obviously coming out of a very rough situation because she looked like she had been battered a little bit. Her car looked like she had hit something. And she had a, a, a young daughter, probably 10, 12, 13, 14, maybe early teens, sitting in the front seat, and she was really skittish. And so as I'm, as I'm pumping, she's pumping hers, and, and I'm just kind of surveying. I, I, at first, I'm, I'm kind of now looking around for a man that, that might you know, be with her, and, and, and no man was there. And so about the time I finished pumping, I, I needed to go in to, to purchase my items. It just turned out that... She had gotten her daughter out of the car and started headed toward the, the, the door at the same time. And so we're kind of rendezvousing. Not intentional. It was, it was just coincidence. And I could tell that the closer we got as we kept our pace, the more nervous she got. And she literally began to shelter her daughter from me. And I'm thinking, this is going to turn into... I can't even do the, 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 the warm western, you know, southern thing here and open the door for her because I, I think I'm going to freak her out if I continue walking along with her. So I just stopped to let her get on ahead. And that made it worse. She was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, no, ma'am, go ahead, please. It, 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 was a, it was a super tense situation. And immediately I'm thinking, what is going on in this lady's life? Okay, so I, I go in and I purchase my drink. She pays, she's coming back towards the door about the same time I'm coming to the door, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. And so I just stopped and let her go, and this time she picked up her pace quicker, like as if she thought I was doing this on purpose now. And they, I mean, they scurried to the car, jumped in it, and heard her to lock the door, and I'm like, wow, what? 
immediately the 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 human in me, right? The 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 man in me, the 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 not Christian in me, okay? That portion that I automatically started jumping to, well, what's going on with her? What's wrong with me? Why does she want to be around me? Well, she just needs Jesus is what she needs. She needs somebody to minister to her because she's obviously going through something. And so I, I, this is what's going on in my mind that she just needs Jesus. Now, on the backdrop of this, I, I'm coming out of a month and a half of reading through a book where I'm being challenged to bring the, the, the judgment of God back into the body of Christ where, where we can hold each other accountable and we can raise that standard back up here and we can stop all the messing around and we, we be who we're called to be, right? I mean, and I think it's a very healthy thing that, that we, we raise that standard and, and, and a, a, a achieve that to the best of our ability. And so that's, that's my mindset is this thing that began to unfold. And so I'm asking myself the question, well, I, I just need to say something to her. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I... I the Holy Spirit has never spoken to me in an audible voice. I, some he may do that. This doesn't work that way with me. But down deep, I felt as if the Holy Spirit asked me this question. Well, what would you say to her? What, what is it that you could say to her right here in this moment that would change that? And I didn't feel like he was saying, hey, let me teach you something real quick. I really felt like it was coming across from, from, from a father to a son in correction, as the Holy Spirit was saying, well, if you did say something, what would you say? What could you say to her that's going to help her right now? And it, it totally redirected my dad. He came in and mentioned something to, to Brother John about it. It totally redirected my steps that day because I spent that day and the days moving forward asking myself that question. Well, what, what would you say to them? Somebody's going through something. Maybe somebody who has... A lot of drama in their life. And you know what they need is God. What are you going to say to them? What could you say in that moment that would help them? Well, you need to get in the Word. Well, you just need Jesus. Let me pray for you. I mean, these are all well-intended. But none of them in that moment would have helped her in that situation. None of them. And I really felt like the Holy Spirit was saying... It's not what you need to say to her. As a matter of fact, it's not the commandments that, uh, that Jesus speaks that she needs to hear. It's what they, that she's supposed to experience through you. Maybe before you ever tell her about God, maybe she needs to experience God. Now, I know that's not in every situation, but there's a time to speak. There's a time to be quiet. I think when it comes to the gospel... We, we need to have this approach. Every one of us, even sitting in this room tonight, though we may be chasing the same Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe we have the same destination in mind, we are all coming from a little bit of a different background. We have different experiences. We, we're we're going to see things just slightly different. And, and maybe we need to let the Holy Spirit lead and guide us, even when we handle one another in the church, too, especially out of the church. Because we're dealing with people who they're going through something right now where the last thing they need to be told is you just need to trust God. Well, we know that that's the ultimate goal. But maybe perhaps instead of hearing it, they need to experience it first. In a lot. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. It really began to minister to my heart. It really began to, to work on me because I know God is calling me as a pastor, me as a Christian believer, me as a, as a man, a Christian man, to raise that bar of expectation for myself and other, every other confessing Christian, especially the men. We need to start being the men that God has called us to be. And that means we, we, we can hold each other accountable. That means we can have very hard discussions. And I know God's calling us to that as a church, but I really believe God is also saying that, but, but make sure that we're not doing this in such a dogmatic fashion that we literally hurt those that are hurting so bad right now. What they need to do is experience the love of God, the commandments of God working through you and me as believers before they'll ever begin to work on them who's just hurting. And right now, the, she, the, the name Jesus probably wouldn't have changed anything in the moment temporarily 
but the experience of Jesus could have possibly changed everything. Are y'all with me tonight? I don't know what happened to her. I, I, I only hope that somewhere along the way, God was able to minister to her. I only hope. But it really changed, refreshed in my mind. Everybody's going through something and they're going through things and they think of things and they're in situations for a specific reason. And instead of me just trying to fix everything I think needs to be fixed, maybe I just need to be a little more patient and kind and loving and let the Holy Spirit show me the times to speak, time to cry, the time to dance, the time to weep. Amen. This is what the gospel works out in us. We can be delivered, but then, but then discipleship through the gospel begins to remove all the old out. And I'm here to tell you, I'm going to speak for me now. I can't speak for you. God isn't just delivering me from the ways of the world. I've been, a, I've been a believer now. I've been an active believer since 1993. I mean, chasing God with everything. God is re-delivering me from a lot of nonsense that I learned as a believer. Things that don't honor Him. And, and I think that's where the body of Christ is at today. It's not just get people in. It, it, God's truly trying to do something in the heart of every person that will trust Him. That's why we, we, we have to go back to the basics and get into his word and let his gospel do its work once again. Even if that work is a renewing in our own lives, bringing a joy for our very salvations, that no matter what happens here, it's temporal and we have eternity, but he's still doing something on the inside of us. Am, am I alone in this tonight or are you guys with me on this? Yes, sir. Amen. And so since bringing that, I, I just wanted to bring a little more of reasoning to you on why I want to slow down and look at this list that we started two weeks ago. And I'm going to recap a couple of these and then we're going to work a few of these out. Um, when we begin to truly trust Jesus, it's not about going to the church. It's, it's not about calling ourselves a Christian. It actually goes beyond having a faith that Jesus died for us. There's, those, are, those are all wonderful things. I don't ever want to take away from that. But it, it goes beyond just putting a faith in Christ. It, he's not tr trying to get us saved and delivered just so He can leave us in the condition that, that He found us. It literally is a plan to make a change on the inside. Literally, he, He's trying to transform each one of us into his image that he has for us. And that can take some time. But when we truly begin to trust Jesus, we're, we begin this journey with him. And through trusting Jesus, here, here's, here's quite a few items that I found personally. You may even have more in Scripture than you've identified. But these are things that I found in Scripture that we went from and we are taken into. Some of them can be instantaneous. Some of them are a process. All of them are experienced at different levels by everybody in here. I, you, I cannot, I will not let my convictions be uh, uh, the condemnation of the conviction I shove in your direction. I speak of them as my, my convictions. If you haven't noticed, in times past, even as we move forward, you may attempt... But you're not, I'm not going to allow you to make your convictions my convictions. I will hear you. I will learn from your mistakes if, if given the opportunity. But if you haven't noticed, people have gotten on to me about, the, and I'm not trying to be funny. I, I, we have a, uh, once a year we like to do what we call a short service where I wear shorts and, and preach in. And I've literally had people say, don't go to that church. That man's going to lead you to hell for preaching in shorts. Uh, that's your conviction. That's not my conviction. I can preach the same gospel in shorts as I can to suit. Amen? Amen. And so I, I promise you, I'm not going to let your convictions become my convictions. I'm going to hear you. I'm surely not going to make, try to make my convictions your convictions because we are all at a different spot with God. But he has the same destination in mind. That's right. That's Amen. Right. And so that, that being said, we're, there's, you're also not going <coughs> to hear me give a license for any kind of a sinful practice. If it's sin, it's sin. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you of it, it's sin. You need to get rid of it. It's between you and God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yes. amen. That's pushing that bar back up. But here's some things that we've identified in Scripture. Uh, when we begin to trust in Jesus, we, we, and some of these may sound elementary and simple. Some may sound kind of like the same thing repeated. These are things I find in Scripture and they're important. We literally went from being lost to being found. 
There was a time in my life. I, I, I literally was raised in a Christian environment, but I did not have a revelation of Jesus Christ until I was married and God was trying to get my attention. And I realized I had to admit all that time growing up, I was not saved. I, I was lost because I didn't have that revelation of Jesus. Even if I was baptized in 1983, I was still lost because it hadn't been a revelation of Christ in my heart. That day in 1993, it was a revelation of Christ in my heart. I had to admit I was lost. And that was the moment I believe I was found. Can I get an amen? amen. And so we're, this, is, this is important. We went from one into another. Number, number two, we, we go from, this is what the gospel does for us. This is what... A, a trusting and a relationship, a growing relationship in Jesus begins to do for us. We go from being spiritually blind to having a spiritual vision. Okay, being spiritually blind to having a spiritual vision. Brother Roy, if you would, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I just want to read five verses here. From, we go from being spiritually blind to having a spiritual vision. Vision. And this is a vision that grows, by the way. This is we begin to see things differently than, than we used to. Um, the Bible kind of gives us an idea, especially in Hebrews chapter six. Once you've tasted of this, once you've partaken of this, once you've experienced this, uh, the, the only way I, I've been able to describe it in my life is I did my fair share of stuff in the world. I'm there's when I'm in, just like everybody in here. I, I made a pretty good sinner. Come on now. I made, I made a pretty decent sinner because there was things that I just was not convicted about and I would go out and do and, and there was there just, and I thought it was cool. I thought I was living my life. Then I began to have a spiritual awareness and I began to experience things in Christ. And I'm just going to say that in my life, I began to, to taste of the substance of God. And I realized that nothing the world has compares to the substance of God. And the, sub, the word substance, I don't find that in Scripture. It's the only way I can describe His presence, the experience that I've had with Him. There's a substance in God. The things of the world stopped really making sense to me. And it came in little bites and pieces. It was easy for me to get away from the things of the world, to be honest with you. I, I, I don't ever want anybody to think I belittle what bondage and, and addiction is. But we, we have to be honest. We always treat sin as if it's just so hard to get over. In all reality, it's just not that hard to be good. It really isn't. It's just not that hard to be decent. Especially if you begin to taste of the substance of God and you compare the substance and the presence of God compared to the substance and, and, and whatever it is the world has to offer, give me God. Give me the experience with God. Can I get an amen? amen. And I'm not being all holy here. I'm being honest with you. There are just times, when, let's go out to the bar and party. Well, let's get over here and get in the Word. I'm going up to, I'm going to go to the Word because I've been in that environment and all I had after that was a hangover and maybe a black eye. Come on. <laughs> Do I have any friends? All I do is bring drama. I get into this environment and I wake up the next morning feeling like I'm alive because of revelation that's come. I'm excited. I can't wait to get back into it. Why? You're, you're, you're in the presence of God and there's a substance there. Brother Roy, if you would please read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just 1 through 5. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We, we, we go from being spiritually blind to now we, we have spiritual vision. This is John chapter 9, verse 39, and this is what Jesus said. 
He said, for judgment, I have come into this world. Here's what part of that judgment looks like. And please understand, the judgment isn't just to make sure that you and I are judged. For judgment, he took a judgment that you and I will never see. Right. That, that judgment we deserved, I may be, I'm, gonna be, I'm, not maybe, I'm going to be held accountable by Jesus Christ for the things that I either did that he didn't want me to do, things I did on my own, idle words I spoke, this is all scripture, but I, there's not one, there's nothing on the inside of me that fears judgment and, or condemnation to hell. Because I'm not going to be on that judgment. I, I'm in the judgment seat of Christ where I'm going to be held accountable for what I did with what he gave me. Why? Because I'm not going to be in that courtroom. I settled my case out of court mm -hmm. when I accepted Jesus Christ for real, that revelation. For judgment. Yeah, he came and took my judgment. I deserved it. He took it. Amen. Yes. For judgment, I have come into this world here. That those who do not see may see. And that those who may see may be blind. He's literally talking about those who think they've got it figured out. You can combine those that are in the, the Pharisees, just call them the church nowadays, those that I'm, I'm okay because I go to church. It's all good because I, I tithe. It's all good because me and God are good. Uh, there, there needs to be a revelation. I thought I was good until I had a real revelation of Jesus Christ and realized I had no idea who Jesus Christ was until that moment. Amen. Sad. But I had no idea. I had an idea of, but I did not know Jesus until that moment when he was revealed to me. Yeah, then my vision began to change. I, I stopped thinking of things the way of the world through this process. I'm still on that process, and I'm, I'm trying to see things the way God would want me to see things. Even with the current circumstance that, that we're, we face in this nation today, our nation is upside down. It's on fire. It's, I mean, there's just, I don't see hardly anything positive or good going on. Uh, almost anywhere in our nation right now. But I, uh, I'm not coming to you as an American first. I'm, tr I'm literally being changed by God to look at things from the world point of view first, the biblical point of view, how God sees things, not as an American, but as a citizen of heaven. Are you guys with me? No, I love America. I'm not anti-America. If, if I have to, I'll, I'll stand up and fight for our rights. But I'm going to fight as a citizen of heaven first. Can I get an Amen. It's important. My, my vision is, is I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blind to the things of God anymore. I, I'm, I'm aware of the things of God. Certain things hurt my feelings. Certain things, I, it's very difficult for me to sit in a room and hear the Lord's name taken in vain. It's very difficult. I just, it, it, it just bothers me. You know? It's, why? Because I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to see things the way God would see them. Amen. It's not being illegalistic either. We, we go from being spiritually blind to having a spiritual vision. Okay, this is, this is another form of that, but number three that we discussed last week. We go from, from being dirty and impure, not just in our actions, but in the way we see, think, feel, act, uh, what's going on in our heart, we, we live in a perverse society. Everything is, is, is turned into some sexual innuendous, you know, uh, connotation, whatever, however you want to put this. We, we turn everything filthy. Uh, the world is filthy. There's, there's, I mean, just, there's just even what we've done in the church. We, we, we haven't brought purity to the world in the last 30 years. We, we've allowed the church to be dumbed down and made filthy. We look just like the world. We think just like the world. We act just like the world, all in the name of we got God's grace. No, that's not what the gospel came to do. The gospel came to make a change. Can I get an amen? Yes. And so what the gospel is supposed to be doing is taking us from an, a dirty and impure presentation to God to being clean and pure before God. By applying the work of Christ. And, and this, this really starts with your heart and your mind. Our, our, our spirit, our, our hearts, our mind. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. The author of Hebrews says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Before you're ever going to serve God with a pure, pure intention, you first have to begin to think pure in your heart. That's why we've got to cleanse the mind, cleanse the heart. Uh, there's got to be a transformation inside before there can ever really be a change on the exterior. 
and then we, we, we stopped with this one last week. We didn't get very far into it. Number four. Am I helping anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. That wasn't number four. That was just a question. <laughs> we go from, from being foolish and ignorant of God to literally knowing God in wisdom. This, this is a lifelong journey, but I've seen this mapped out quite a few times in my life with certain situations and circumstances that have, have kind of come to the surface. And I realized I, I, I wanted to be proud of myself for seeing some growth. That I, I looked at a certain situation and I didn't think of it the way uh, the carnal mind would want to think of it. I, I actually applied God in it. Then I can also stand before God and he can point to a few few moments when I was pre presented with opportunity and I didn't look at it the way God wanted me to look at it. I looked at it from my foolish and ignorant mind. And and something we need to to you know embrace in in our lives is it's okay to admit ignorance in stuff. We're all ignorant in this room. We all have a form or an area of ignorance in, in areas in this room. It's okay. I'm not, I didn't say we're stupid. Ignorance and stupidity are not the same thing. I don't believe that we should call each other stupid. But it is not harmful to say we're ignorant. Because there's certain things that I'm ignorant about. Anybody that says I'm not ignorant, then then you know everything there is to know. I'm sorry, there's things that I'm ignorant about. And if I'm ignorant about something, I need to stay away from that topic until I learn it. Amen? And especially if, and here's the problem. Why, why is this important? There's been a lot of ignorance come from the pulpits across this nation. There's been a lot of foolish ignorance that has been spewed out. Silly things that have been, people have been throwing around out there. And it turns into this doctrine. It turns into some kind of a, 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 a system of belief that they follow. I think TikTok is destroying the body of Christ. Because there's a lot of ignorance that's being spewed out in little bites here and there through TikTok. And, and it can be dangerous. Silly little things. And I say we need to admit maybe, maybe God's trying to take us from, from, from being ignorant in certain things. Into having wisdom in certain things. And it starts with... Where he's at in this. Acts chapter 9, uh, 3, Acts chapter 3, verses 17 on, Peter gives us an example of this, and he, and he is speaking to, to the leaders of the, the, the Sanhedrin. He's speaking to, to the Jews and to those that were trying to persecute him and John and others for following Jesus. And in the middle of this debate, or this argument, this presentation, Peter's speaking to them. He said, yet now, brethren, he says, I, speaking about killing Jesus, putting Jesus to death. He says, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. So he was literally saying that those of you that supported the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, you guys did it ignorantly. You just need to own it, admit it. You did it ignorantly. You have no idea who Jesus is. Had you known exactly who Jesus was, you wouldn't have done that. But you did it ignorantly. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, Paul said, This I say, therefore, and testify to the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. He also wrote, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.13, he said, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And this is where I shared with you last week or two weeks ago that we've all had that, that thing that we, we grew up being told, what you don't know won't hurt you. I say what you don't know could kill you. There are certain things that we don't need to be ignorant of. There's actually great wisdom and revelation that God desires for us to have. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul said, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. There's a lot of believers out there that they believe, but they don't really believe that there's things that God has for them. I'm not talking about the big gifts that the, 
the prosperity circles want you to focus on. They're, they're just things that God has lined up for the body of Christ to embrace and to have. And a lot of it comes through wisdom and revelation. And, and it's, not, it's not a sin because God brings blessings into your life. We can be very ignorant of some of these things. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He's speaking of Jesus. He said, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. We, I, to this day, I still believe that there is there's a, a, a thing called righteousness or being just before God. Okay, that we stand before him. I don't stand before him hoping that he's going to make me righteous one day. I don't stand before him hoping that I'm going to make myself righteous for him. I stand before him embracing Jesus Christ, believing in my heart that I'm righteous because of what Jesus did. Not on my own works, on his works. That comes through wisdom. You ask a lot of the body of Christ today, are you righteous? And the answer you're going to get is, well, I hope to be one day. Well, do you truly believe that Jesus died for you? I mean, has that been a revelation to you? Are you in relationship with him and growing? Because if you truly believe and you are really growing in Christ, I'm going to tell you right now, before God, you're righteous through Christ. Period. It's not something you earn. It's not something that you, you stand in. Righteousness is a state, not an action. Can I get an amen? Righteousness does not mean, well, all is perfect in my life. It's got nothing to do with what's in your life there. You're standing in him. Now he's trying to work things out in you. Amen. Amen. And so this, we're ignorant of these things. James chapter 1 verse 5, James gives us an amazing insight. Something that, that I've learned to pull on. Well, every time that I'm struggling with a decision or struggling with revelation or just whatever the situation is, as a husband, as a father, as a man... Yeah, I've been married 32, been together with her 33 years all together, been married 31, 32 years here. Um, I, there's, no, I, there's no way I've got this thing figured out. There's no way. We've come a long, 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 long way. But every morning I wake up, there's something new that I have to learn, something new that I don't know in our relationship. And I know I'm talking to the right crowd, right? How do, how do I, how do I, I don't, I don't break out a book on relationships. I'm sorry. I read one book that helped me in my relationship with Renee, and it's called The Five Love Languages. But from that point forward, I had to, to grow. How do I do this? I ask, I do exactly what James said here. I ask God for wisdom, and then I get into the Word. And it's amazing how He begins to show certain things in the Word. And most of the time, it's never about how Renee needs to change things. It's always about how I need to change things. Amen. Do I have any friends in the room now? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, say that again, brother. I hate to say it. It, it is almost it's usually my fault. Almost every time. Yes. Almost every time. Why? Because this is this is what wisdom brings. Wisdom brings through, when we begin to ask. That I'm I, I'm stop being ignorant about certain things because I really, I was really ignorant a lot. You know, when when Renee and I first got together, um, we came from good homes but different homes. I came from a home with my father was a former Marine. He was, he was always calm. I've seen my father mad maybe three times in my life. My dad was always that calm guy. He was not, he's never been afraid in his life. He just always had the ability to stay calm and everything. And so I, that's how he responded whenever he and my mother would fuss. Dad was always calm, cool, and collected. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing. Well, sure, that, that's going to bleed off on to, to the kids. Renee came from a home that, that had a different perspective. Her father was an alcoholic. And so in order to get his attention, he wasn't a violent alcoholic. He was a lazy alcoholic. And so to, in order to get his attention, mom would have to, you know, get physical with him. That's what she saw. So the first couple of years in our, in our, in our marriage, I mean, in our ignorance, my perspective was, you're not going to get a rise out of me. I'm just going to stand here and do what my dad did. And I made a mistake a few times of, Talk to the palm, talk to the hand. That's not how she, she saw things different. And so we found ourselves in this debate of how, how do we communicate? Because, it, it, I mean, do I have any friends in the room now, right? 
And so I'm in a men's ministry one day, and I'm grieving before God on this thing. I'm like, what do I do? I mean, I had worldly advice that says, just put her in her place one time. You just show her who, who's boss. Mm -hmm. Physically, I can knock her through the wall. Mm -hmm. And so some were saying, just do it one time. You don't have to do it that one time. You'll never have to do it again. Yeah, after I get out of prison, now maybe, right? I mean, that can't be the advice. It's stupid. I'm in a men's ministry one day, and this gentleman stands up, and he begins to tell about all the things that his wife was doing to him. And, and what she was doing? I mean, my wife is a saint. I, was all, I mean, just, just saintly compared to the things that were going on over there. And he said he was griping to God. And God literally spoke to him and said, yeah, 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 she's that. Yeah, she's that. Yeah, yeah, she's that too. Yeah, she did that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But Bobby, you're the worst one in the situation because I called you to be the spiritual head of that home. And the moment that he said that, the Holy Spirit said, stop griping to me about your wife. You never one time come to me and prayed for her. You always pray about her. And it's like this revelation came, right? Wisdom came into this thing. And I knew right then, oh, you're right. And I just began to pray, not for Renee on that, not about her. God, fix me. You called me to be the spiritual head of that home. A couple weeks later, we, we, we're heading down one of those moments where you just know things are going to get riled in this argument. You guys, I know I'm not talking to... You, you've been in those moments, right? This is going to be one of them ugly fights, right? This is I'm not going to lose this fight today. But as we begin to go down this road, all of a sudden she started saying things that... Ah, I knew the Holy Spirit was talking to her. Why? Because I, I, when I was praying, I wasn't praying about her. I was praying for her. I was praying about me. And all of a sudden, it's like the wisdom came into this thing. James says, if you need wisdom, ask. Ask for wisdom. Because God will bring wisdom. Hey, God isn't going to hold back on this. God's not, he's not two-faced in this thing. He's not a different person over here, different over here. If you ask and don't doubt in this thing, he's going to bring wisdom from above. Can I get an amen? amen? And sometimes it takes a little time for that wisdom to flesh out. But this is the difference from being foolish of the things of God and having the wisdom of God. And it's something that we do to this day as we try to grow in his wisdom. The next one we have, this, is, this has been one that in my life, God uses this for me to show me just how good God has been to me, whether I've deserved it or not. We go from being at war with God. This is scripture. This isn't, I'm not making these words up. We go from being at war with God. As a matter of fact, the Bible called us the enemies of God. It's not just, I just don't believe in God. An unbelief in God puts you, puts you into the category of being the enemy of God. There's, there's not three sides in this thing. You're either a believer or you're an unbeliever. And if you're an unbeliever, according to the word, we are at war with God. I was an unbeliever. I was at war with God because I was putting more faith in the world. But we go from being at war with God to having peace with God. We go from being the enemy of God to being the friend of God. Can I get a witness tonight? Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 tells us this. For when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more now, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He also wrote in Colossians 1.21, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. As enemies, and of course the scripture, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, when we were away from him, his work was for us. I was an enemy of God, whether I realized it or not. Now I'm the friend of God because of who Christ is. He is my Savior, right? Now I want to talk about God. I don't want to put God and Jesus in the same bracket here. They are at one, but I, I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in the Trinity. I believe that, that there's not one God that is a personality over here, then he becomes a personality over here, then a, that I believe in three distinct beings, if you would, three distinct persons, if you would. I believe in God the Father, I believe in His Son, Jesus, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
They are three separate. Can I get an amen? Yes. But they are one. Yes. It's important because God doesn't become what he needs to be in the moment and then all of a sudden he shows up as Jesus. No, I, 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 I think we need to be practical about this. God the Father loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And Jesus is my Lord and Savior. God is the Father. He is Lord. He is God. But he's so much more than that to me. And I, I say this with respect because I think this gets, this, this gets abused in, in modern uh, 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 Christianity. God isn't just this being up in heaven that is sovereign over our lives and he sits on a throne. He is that. But he's also my friend. He's my father. Amen. He's so much more because of who his son is in me. But I'm very careful with, with how I present this. I think that we can belittle who God is if we turn him into just our daddy that we talk to. I'm not picking on anybody in here. But, but he's so much more than just a daddy. So much more than just a father. He is my friend, but he's not my chum. Right. Amen. He's not my pal that we just, we're going to go pal around today and, and he's just going to tolerate the things that come out of my mouth. No, he's my friend, but he's still sovereign. And there's still a, a, a fear of God in me. But the, the, to me, this means so much more because that, that father, that Lord, that that. That divine being that's on that throne in heaven that spoke everything that we have into existence. The one that can snap his fingers and make it all disappear if he so chose. That one happens to be my friend. Yes. He loves me enough that there's a relationship with his son that connects me to the creator of the universe. Come on now. Amen. This kind of thing happens through the gospel. The gospel brings an, an awareness, a wisdom and shows me you used to be his enemy. Uh, you're not his enemy anymore. Now, I, you're his son, and you're a pile of mess that he's working on, but he loves you. Amen. I have a relationship with you. I don't, when I approach God in fear, I don't approach God thinking, oh, man, he's going to stomp me out because of what I thought last night. No, I approach God in fear knowing he could, but knowing he won't because of what he said through his son. Amen. This is, this is what the gospel does. It begins to change. We went from being his enemy to his friend. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Listen, I know I quote and speak the book of Romans a whole bunch because it's just awesome. You, you, you really need to go read chapter 5. The whole chapter. It's not that long. Go read chapter 5 and you, go, you come back and tell me if you don't see the grace of God at work in Romans chapter 5. Because there's five different times that we call it the five much mores. Five different times there's a comparison of what we, mankind used to have and what mankind has. And what we have here is much more than what they had there. And there were some pretty good things there. There were some pretty bad things there. And the judgment of God, by the way, I'm going to add this in there. The judgment of Christ in the end days, that is going to be a much more judgment than the judgment we've seen in the Bible. Because it, it, it's the wrath of the Lamb that's going to take place. It's, it's Jesus coming to literally deal with all those that have rejected Him. Come on. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that word justified, having been made righteous by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace is the word irene, and it literally means a state of national tranquility. It means the war is over. Didn't say God just going to leave you the way he found you. No, no, no. There's a whole lifetime of work. That he's, he, you are part of his family now, and now he wants to groom you into being who he's called you to be. You've got to open yourself up to that. You've got to put yourself on that potter's wheel, and you've got to let him go to work. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. And then the, the, I have more to get to, but we don't, we're not going to be able to tackle all these tonight. Um, I, I want to I look at this, this next one because this one tends to come up quite a bit. Now, this, actually, these next two go hand in hand, but I, I'm good enough with just doing the, this, this first part of this one tonight. We go from being children of wrath to being the beloved children of God. I went from being a child of wrath. What do you mean, my child of wrath? <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, Romans chapter 5 is an awesome chapter. Romans chapter 1 is an awesome chapter too. You, you need to go read Romans chapter 1. It's, it's powerful. You need to read uh, the, whole, the whole chapter. Especially when you, when you get through the first 16 verses. And it, it, it kind of highlights that, that we're, we're, you know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the gospel of Christ that brings salvation to us with the revelation of this. Okay, who he is, revelation of Jesus Christ. Then you get into verse 18, and it literally says, Now the wrath of God is revealed from heaven too. Not just the gospel and righteousness uh, through it. It's the wrath of God that he wants us to understand. So the gospel just doesn't bring an awareness of what he's doing for us. The gospel is supposed to also bring an awareness of what he spared us from. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven. And then from verse 18 all the way to the end of the chapter... It literally gives us a roadmap, in my opinion, gives us a roadmap on how we ought to deal with, how we should understand, begin to understand those that do not live their lives the way the Word says they need to live their lives. We need to understand what's going on in their life, especially those that have been presented with the truth of God and they've chosen to worship the creation and not the Creator. What can God do with that? According to Romans chapter 1, you, you choose that. That's your decision. I'm going to turn you over to that debased mindset. And with a debased mindset in the hands of the enemy who, who is nothing but perversion, why do you think our nation, our world is in the shape it's in? Because there's a lot of people, in my opinion, that have rejected God, been presented with the truth, the evidence was there, and they decided not to. They, they would rather ch chase the creation and not the creator. And I'm sorry. I, there's nothing in me that's a Calvinist. I do not believe that God is just going to sovereignly intervene because of, I believe that he's always going to let man have his decision and his will in this thing. And if you choose, you get. Can I get an amen? amen. That's the scripture. That's the word. That's the Bible. That's also why I don't, I'm not going to promote this idea that we're going to pray in our guide to the White House. No, I'm going to pray for the hearts of man to change. I'm not praying that God will put the guy he wants in the White House back in the White House. God, God will work on the hearts of men, and men will make the decision. Amen? So the prayer to put the right guy in the White House or get the guy out of the White House, that's the wrong prayer. We need to be praying for the hearts of men, hearts of people, that the Holy Spirit would begin to minister to the hearts. You put the Holy Spirit in the, in the, in the person and their life begin to change, you don't have to worry whether or not they're going to make the right voting decision. Amen? There you go. That'll fix a lot. <laughs> Amen? We waste a lot of prayers. Worrying whether or not he's going to put our guy back in. Get our guy back in. Oh, how about pray for the hearts of people to start making the right... Their decisions go far beyond what's going on in the White House. There needs to be some purity back in the body of Christ today. Amen. We need the Spirit of God at work. We go from being children of wrath, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So it's, it's when, when, we, when we have the appetite of the flesh, the appetite of the flesh, the, the, our biggest war isn't, you know, well, you need to stop that dancing and stop that drinking and stop that dipping and whatever it is that, that we, we want to pick on. No, it, it, those, those, are the, those are the side arguments the enemy has us uh, worried with. You know, and we've, we've gotten over it in, in this church but believe me, there are circles of Christians today that would never accept Brother John into their church. Why? Because John's doctrine is terrible. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Because tattoos. They, they actually get hung up on the tattoos thinking that that's the sin. And I'm thinking, what? It's, it's not this. It's this. Right here. Why? Because that's how, that's how they're supposed to act. They're children of wrath. They don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit working in them. They're children of wrath. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do in that moment. Is which why we need to express the love of Jesus. Are y'all with me so far? Yes. He says we we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, and he goes on. It's a comma there. He says fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The biggest hurdle we have out there, men and women, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And then blaming it on everything else around them. I did this because. I act this way because. No, no. Let's just be honest. I'm, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not ever going to have a because moment in front of God there. I did that because I was fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Period. 
<coughs> clicked on that computer screen and chased whatever was on that computer screen because of the lust of the flesh fulfilling that. That's what God's trying to get a hold of. It's, this, this nation is running rampant with it. It's everywhere. That's why it keeps coming up. Keep ourselves pure, sexually pure. There's a purity that God wants. Why? Because when we're sexually pure, we're not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh at the level that the enemy wants us to fulfill that. Men, 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 we need to fight this battle. It's up to us. Stop thinking the women need to pray us through this thing. Men, we need to step up and fight this battle. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, we, we're fighting the lusts of the flesh. All right. That's what children of wrath do. But instead, he's got a different plan for us. He wants us to be the beloved children of God. Now, I'm going to give you a couple scripture references. Field a question or two if, if it's there, and, and then we'll, we'll pray. And have, have I helped anybody tonight? Amen. Amen. This is now going from the children of wrath to being the beloved children of God. But John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Brother John, pull up Hebrews chapter 11. We've got a, we've got a, a minute or two, right? Are we good? He, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It's the hall of faith. But there's, there's something that I think we'll we just, we just go right over. Because it's a wonderful verse. We quote it all the time. Without faith, it's what? Yeah. Who believes that scripture? Well, I do. It's not a trick question. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's an important part of that scripture, right? But that's not the important part of that scripture. That's not the emphasis of that specific verse. That's important. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But we, we speak this, well, you just throw out your faith and then God's happy. Yeah, sort of. There's something deeper here that we keep we keep excusing this. We just, 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 just put your faith in it. Let's go. There's, there's, there should be some actions to faith. There should be some evidence of faith. There, there, sh there should be some, uh, some signs pointing to the faith that's going on in your life. Leading up to this, he gives us the beginning of the examples of the hall of faith. There's a guy named Enoch that, well, you know, he walked with God and was no longer because of his faith in God. Then there's two brothers. Cain and Abel, they came to God and presented their offering. We know God received one and rejected the other. It was the way they came to God. They, they, the key word, they came to him. Are y'all with me? Let's look at it. Then it goes right into the very next verses. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Then there's this great big old huge comma. Let's go to verse 6, brother. Come on down to verse 6. All right. What's that? The enemy does not want me to share this tonight. Was it ten, what was it Verse 6. It's Hebrews 11, 6. Yeah, you were there. Right there, stop. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. There, there's a comma there. Can we, for the love of everything that's pure and holy, can we stop just taking things out of context? There's nothing wrong with that scripture, that verse, the idea behind it. But it does actually mean so much more when you, when you think of it within the context. It's not just about believing that, that Jesus did this. God actually has something that he wants to do through us. But he first needs to do it in us. Are y'all with me? Amen. It's impossible to please him without faith. Comma, which means he's still talking. For he who comes to God. Well, he just got through giving us the, the, some examples of those that came to God. One came to God with this sacrifice. The other came with that sacrifice. They're both found within the law of God that was going to be given many years later. So they're actually both accepted, except for one came with the right heart and one did not. For he who comes to God must believe two things. This is powerful, church. One, that he is. This isn't just a scripture for how God started things. This is a scripture for us tonight. Who do men say that I am? Well, I don't think you're this prophet or that prophet. I say you are the son of the living God. Revealed to you by my Father in heaven. That's that scripture. On that, the church is still being birthed. You must believe that he is. Speaking of Jesus, that he is. It doesn't stop there. 
You also must believe that without faith it's impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, yeah. I was a child of wrath. I'm no longer that child of wrath anymore. I'm no longer that enemy. I'm his friend because I stand before him believing that he is who he says he is. And I actually, with that same fervor and same faith, believe that he rewards those that diligently seek him. That word reward re literally means a renumerator. Renumerator. In our dictionaries, renumerator literally means to repay the price, the wages, or the debt. You come to him. He who comes to him must believe these two things, that he is. He is everything that he's supposed to be. You're not going to get to, to, to the Father by going through some version of Christ. You go through the fact is that he is the son of the living God. Amen. And he will literally reward those who diligently seek him. You're not going to waste your time. You won't waste your time. That's what that message is. It will, it will not be a waste of time to diligently seek Him if your heart is right before Him. Come to Him and do this. Can I get an amen tonight? Amen. There's, I've got several others that we do not have time to get to tonight. I need to pray and, and we need to be dismissed. Anybody have a comment or question on this before we jump? No? Have I helped anybody? Yes, sir. I love the Word. I love studying the Word. I have this huge expectation that 2024 is going to bring an abundance of revelation. Why? Because I'm praying it. I'm believing it. I'm expecting it. Father, it's in the name of your son that we thank you for your exposed truth. Truth that has been truth our entire life. It does not change because we decide to believe it. But it sure changes us when we do. And so, Father, I thank you for that. I thank you that the Holy Spirit is at work. I do pray for a continued spirit of wisdom and revelation to be upon us. Not just here, but when we dismiss, we go home. Anytime we open the word, anytime we, we fellowship, anytime we have intentions of growing and learning, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be upon us. Father, we continue to lift those that are praying in hope and faith to overcome, to be healed, to be restored. We lift up those that are praying for their homes, Father, for marriages, for income, provision. Father, I, I know that you are at work. Go with us when we leave tonight. Go before us, prepare a path, and bring us back Sunday morning with a spirit of expectation, Father. As we say goodbye to one year and embrace the next, we're going to come with huge expectation. All to glorify you. It's in your name we pray. The church said amen. amen. I love each and every one of you. God bless you and hopefully we'll see you Sunday.